I think if there's any sort of like positive that we can turn around and take out of this once it's all done and dusted is being able to 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 show empathy and 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 concern for the people in our community that feel like this every day of their lives like you know I think I'll certainly have a different view on life and 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 things like that and just how lucky I am at the end of it so yeah. this is the deep in the weeds podcast I'm Anthony Huckstep The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been swift and brutal, but the hospitality sector is showcasing its natural ability to adapt and keep on fighting. I've got one of Australia's best chefs with me at the moment, Jackie Chalanor. How are you going, Jackie? How are you holding up? Hi. Um, holding up as best we can. Um, it certainly hasn't been a great week or week and a half for us. Um, in fact, I've had the worst week of my career um you know the the emotional just washing machine that we've just been in for the last week is just it's it's pretty soul destroying um you know having to sit down and and tell 50 people that they don't have jobs anymore is one of you know the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life um and yeah it's just it's been a really really tough week well, I think to give some context for people that may not know, like we'll get to what has happened because of the pandemic, but you've actually had a pretty difficult eight months with the restaurant, um, starting with the fire at Nomad, then you moved the vet, moved venues and then the bushfires impacted things. Like um, how can you tell us a bit about that sort of period and how you've adapted and, and sort of dealt with all of that? Yeah, so um- – September last year, we had a fire at the restaurant, which just wiped us out. Um, but, you know, we were pretty determined to, to keep going. Um, and we ended up with the ex Long Green site after Jock um, finished up with his residency for Arana. And, you know, we very speedily opened a restaurant there. And from, I think we went from getting the keys handed over to opening doors to the public in 10 days, which was just, insane um and you know that was um a hugely hugely trying time for us you know we didn't know if it was going to succeed we didn't know if people were going to follow us um and and you know really thankfully so people did and and we had an amazing christmas and you know the team was all in high spirits and looking forward to you know rebuilding our original site at foster street and and seeing it through until i think uh, we had the lease signed till the end of June. And then, you know, we had a great Christmas and, and then all of a sudden the bushfires roll around and, and the droughts and the floods and that just wreaks havoc on trade for that period. Um, you know, January is often always a difficult month in hospitality, but this just completely, completely knocked us for six as well. Um, yeah. Do you want to just um, take us through um, sort of when this started to unfold for you with this pandemic because you guys had sort of found your feet a little bit and just sort of getting things back on track after that. And um, when did you notice things start to change, uh, you know, in the last fortnight or so? And, and can you take us through it? Yeah, well, the, the you know, we knew that things were, you know, the the dramas were – like ever increasing and unfolding and we, you know, we were keeping an eye on things and being mindful about what we were doing. But to be completely honest with you, like we had uh, our last, what was last week? So the week ending the, like the 15th, we had a perfectly normal trade week, like a hundred percent, you know, we did 300 people plus on Saturday night, um, you know, 150 for lunch on the Saturday, completely, you know, average week for, for Nomad. And then by the time Monday rolls around, you know, we had six people booked for lunch and 20 for dinner and it just progressively got worse throughout the week. Um, you know, we had the, the announcements from the PM and each time one of those happened, we'd lose 20 covers and then we'd lose 20 covers and it would just keep going. And it, it got to the point by, you know, Friday night, we normally go into service with a minimum of 300 people booked. Um, 
and a wait list and we ended up with 50 people on the books um and you know for a it it just it there was no warning for us you know like we obviously were aware of what was happening but it just the way that it went from a perfect trade week to that so rapidly it just like i think we're all just in a tailspin and and you know it's not like there was any sort of lead up to you know gradual downturn of trade it was just instant yeah but i think your response was pretty instant one of the things that i realized um, it was, I mean, geez, it's only last week. It feels like so long ago. Um, when I was putting that article together about the impact of the industry and you adapted and changed so quickly to, to produce, um, veg boxes and, um, takeaway and it, it, it almost felt like that you were ready for it. But sound, sound, listening to you now, you obviously weren't, but you, that adapt, that ability to adapt and change so quickly. Can you tell us about what you guys did to try and sort of keep the doors open and? So we um, straight away just opened up our whole menu to to pick up um, pick up um, takeaway food. Um, you know the food was there. We had it all on in stock because we'd obviously for us Mondays and Tuesdays are big prep days for us. So we you know we generally order up big on Saturday night so that the guys can kind of go hard and set themselves up for the week. So we had stock in house um but there just wasn't anybody in the dining room to to go through it so we were you know we opened the doors up straight away for takeaway um there wasn't a huge uptake in that though unfortunately um you know i think over the weekend we might have done about 20 orders um we set up a i designed a menu specifically for uber eats delivery menu log just you know more of a like meze kind of hummus dips flatbreads falafel like manouche simple sort of like that style of food that i think could compete with the uber eats market um but we you know waiting on all of the the terminals and all that sort of jazz to come through so we didn't actually ever get that off the ground um I planned to launch this week, um, you know, like home cooked meal boxes. We were going to do, um, you know, just sort of take home like a whole roast chicken with sides and things like that. And then the plan was to also do produce boxes and include some of my recipes in there as well. So that people, you know, there's people that are home and probably bored and looking for things to do. So I thought offering the raw produce and a recipe to a company, it would have been a great idea to keep people busy and give them something to do. But that was the plan to launch all that this week. And then unfortunately, it all went to hell in a handbasket really quickly. Um, yeah. And so you guys had to close the doors this week you know what what is the state of the restaurant is there plans is it closing temporarily um are you holding on to some staff like what's what what's the situation um at the you know there's not really any holding us back and our plan is to reopen our original space in foster street um luckily you know throughout all this we are in a you know, a, a decent sort of position in that the rebuild at Foster Street is covered by insurance. So that's not something that is, you know, coming out of the owner's pockets, um, which we can be really thankful for because it means at the end of all this, we're going to have a brand new dining room to open up. That's so great to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's sort of the light at the end of the tunnel really. Um, so we've cancelled the lease at Commonwealth Street and we'll be clearing the space out um, by mid next month. Um, so the plan, you know, as we aren't every, at the entire team has been stood down at this point. Um, uh, the plan is by doing that is that we have, you know, the capability to open up Nomad again in, you know, however long it takes for us to get it up off the ground. Um, and, and our team comes back to a, an empty kitchen full of jobs and, and the front of house team and everybody has a job in six months or three months or however long it takes for this whole circus to die down. Um, yeah. And that's, and that, I guess that unpredictability is the, there's the issue at the moment as well, isn't it? It's just totally. that, that level of uncertainty that we're all. Yeah. We've got, we've got a six month game 
plan sort of in place um, and that's sort of what we've prepared ourselves for. Um, the, the plan was always to open Foster Street around June. Um, so I suppose it all depends on how extreme the lockdowns get. You know, if builders can keep doing what they're doing, then great, and we may stay on track. Um, but if not, you know, we're all kind of at the mercy uh, at, to the government and, and this pandemic as every industry and everybody in Australia is. So just kind of waiting out to see what happens. Jackie, can you remember the first day you started in hospitality and, you know, um, why, why on earth you got into the industry? I do, I do. Um, I, oh, I've always loved food. I never wanted to be a chef. Um, I originally wanted to get into food photography and styling or nutrition. And I, yeah, um, one of my teachers in high school, she was my hospitality food tech teacher, had a friend who worked for Women's Weekly and she recommended that I do this course at TAFE um, that kind of covered a lot of the basic sort of components of the industry just to get, you know, get a dip a toe in the water. And I did it. And I found that the day that I looked forward to most out of the week was the practical component. Um, so we did one day in the kitchen every week and I always walked out of that class smiling and it was the most fun I had. And, and I think that I just kind of realized that that was where I was supposed to be. And, you know, I told mum and dad and they freaked out. (laughs) Um, and, and I think I, I just kind of kept banging on about it for a really long time. And, I was always too scared because I thought it was a boys club and, you know, I wouldn't fit in and, it, you know, so I, and eventually one of my best mates got sick of me talking about it and said, would you just shut up and go and apply for an apprenticeship? Cause we're sick of hearing you whinge about it and not do anything about it. And so I did. And I got the first job that I applied for, um, which was at about life in Roselle and, my very first day there. I think actually it was about a week before I started. I My auntie called my mum and said, has Jacqueline got a job at About Life? And mum was like, yeah, why? How do you know about it? And she's like, Dwayne works there. So Dwayne is my cousin who is also a chef. And I had no idea that he worked there. And it was just by complete coincidence that we both got jobs at the same place. Um, Did that make it easier for you starting? Um, yeah, I think so. Having a friendly face there. Um, but I remember I walked into the kitchen and, you know, green as ever with my little TAFE neckerchief on and, and the full get up. And I walked in the kitchen and every single person in there stopped what they were doing. And they all started seeing Jack, Jack, Jackie. And I was just like, Oh my God. (laughs) And that continued every day of my employment for the rest of the time I worked there. Um, I got a very pleasant greeting every time I walked in the kitchen. Let's say that. Um, yeah, so that was that was my first day in the kitchen, and I loved it there. I had a great time. I learned lots. Um, you've had um, you've had a lot of challenges in sort of the recent period with business and stuff like that. But you know, have you ever sort of had any sort of stuff ups and like crazy stuff happen like through your career in those kitchens? Um, cause, oh God, I don't. It's it's been. It's been a wild ride and and a funny ride and I don't like I'm trying to rack my brain for some some good stories but I just you know I it's it's you know the the thing I love most about the industry and it's kind of funny that it was the thing that scared me off in the first place was just the the banter and the camaraderie and just the day-to-day musings of kitchen life is I think the thing that I love the most and it's I don't you know off the top of my head right now I don't think I can think of you know one particular thing but I just you know the the laughs that you get on a daily basis in a kitchen it just it's second to none it's the it's the thing I love most about being in a kitchen do you think that camaraderie is you know and enabling people to to fight on and and take this on and deal with this adversity at the moment like because i've worked in hospitality too and i totally understand that everyone's on the same team 
you know, it's, it's pretty extraordinary industry to work in. And, um, is that, is that something that you think that is going to help it get through this pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, like I'm getting texts and phone calls from chefs all around town and, you know, there's WhatsApp groups that we're all just talking and to each other and just keeping in contact and checking in on each other. And, um, just the, you know, everybody's so concerned about, you know, their own situations, but it doesn't stop anybody being concerned about their neighbors and their friends and their peers and their colleagues. And, you know, as you know, it's so true when people say that hospitality is a family, like it, you know, I think people outside the industry maybe don't understand it quite so well, but it's so completely true. And, you know, just, just having somebody, you know, shoot you a text in the morning and just be like, are you okay? How are you traveling? It means so much. And I think it's, you know, it just, and I said this, you know, after like cook for the bush and the support we got for that, I was just so completely humbled by the way everybody just banded together and, and did what they could to help out. And, and we're seeing it again now. And it's, you know, it's, it's a really beautiful thing. And as shitty as this situation is, it's, you know, it, it really does open your eyes to how lucky, you know, we are sometimes. And even though it might not feel like it right now, it's, we will get through it. And, and, you know, there is a, there is a brighter side at the end of this story. And, um, I think, you know, I was talking to the girls from Oz Harvest this morning and, um, just saying that, I think at the end of this, all of us are going to turn around and and be grateful for what we have and what we had before this whole situation and maybe come out with a bit of empathy for the people who feel like this every day of their lives and not know where their next meal is coming from because, you know, we – we've all been so lucky to not have to worry about that. And, and now all of a sudden we're like, can we pay our rent? Can we buy, can we afford to put food on the table? And, you know, I like my heart breaks for people who have to feel like this every day because it's or have never felt anything but this every day of their lives. You know, I think we have so much to be grateful for. So, you know, I think if there's any sort of like positive that we can turn around and take out of this once it's all done and dusted is being able to, to, to show empathy and, and, and concern for the people in our community that feel like this every day of their lives. Like, you know, I think I'll certainly have a different view on life and, and, and things like that and just how lucky I am at the end of it. So, yeah. I think I think that's a really beautiful thing, and I I tend to agree with you. I um I don't, I don't think until you experience something like this, you can truly realize how other people have experienced trauma and adversity, and um and I guess that sense of fear, as you were saying, it's we, as a society, certainly in Australia, many of us haven't felt that before, and this this uncertainty and the impact of it is um. Yeah, it's it certainly should hopefully change some perceptions if the positive is going to be out of that on how we treat the earth and how we treat each other. And um, how do you how do you see you know what, once we sort of get the curve down and start moving forward again, how do you see things playing out in the industry? You know, coming back. Um, look, us hospitality folk are a resilient, resourceful bunch. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't get into a career where you have to work, you know, 16 hour days and never see your family and, you know, make so many sacrifices or, you know, we don't do it for the money. We do it for the love of what we do. And, you know, our, the very nature of what we do is nurturing people and looking after people and serving people. And there's, you know, there's a, a special type of person that does that. So I think we all just at the moment need to remember, you know, why we do it and why we got into this industry, even though it's, it's not our best friend at the moment. Um, and you know, we will come back. Um, you know, unfortunately there are going to be some venues that, that don't make it through this one, but you know, everyone will 
continue the fighting spirit and and they'll fight their way back and there is another side to this and you know we just need to we need to do our part now um and and as soon as this is all over let's just you know get the get our incredible dining scene back up and running and and yeah i i I don't know what else to say but just you know there is another side to it and sometimes it's bloody hard to see it um and i think it's still sinking in for a lot of people as it is me um but you know i think we just need to stay positive and and remember that you know there is a light at the end of this tunnel and and a few negronis at the bar waiting for us all i think (laughs) yeah i'm I'm down with that definitely listen um (laughs) you're you're (laughs) You're, you're an absolute legend. I know it's been the toughest week of your life. It's extraordinary that you've given us a bit of time to share your story. And, um, but hopefully it gives people a bit of hope out there. And, um, listen, best of luck. Stay safe. And thank you so much again, Jackie. No, thank you for having me. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. A special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Stay safe, isolate and be well.